When it comes to the search for extraterrestrial civilizations, extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. If we had invested $10 billion in the search for extraterrestrial civilizations, similar to the budget allocated to the Large Hadron Collider or the Webb Space Telescope, we might have already found our cosmic partners, and the cosmos might not have been as lonely and dark as it appears to us now. Over the past 70 years, we searched for radio signals from other intelligent civilizations, but this is like waiting for a phone call. Nobody may be calling us while we are waiting. A better approach is to search for packages that might have already arrived at our mailbox. The senders may be dead, but any trash they left behind in the ocean of interstellar space could be our treasure. This is a quote from the latest article from Dr. Avi Loeb entitled Alien Hunting. The reason he's chosen to release an article like this right now is because the results of his search off the coast of New Guinea for UFO debris or debris of some sort of interstellar object that struck our atmosphere on January 8th, 2014 has finally borne fruit. They now have the final results of the chemical analysis of the tiny spherules that were discovered off the coast of New Guinea, spherules that definitely came from an object that originated in outer space, spherules that bear a great deal of resemblance to the types of spherules that we would expect to find in the aftermath of a meteor impact, but the chemical composition after a year of analysis has proven that this debris definitely did not come from our solar solar system. Indeed, it bears no resemblance to any meteor or any asteroid that we have ever discovered in the past. As a matter of fact, it bears no resemblance to much of any sort of natural material that occurs here in the solar system, leading many to conclude that this might be the product of an extraterrestrial civilization. But how do we know? How can we say for certain that this object came from another star system? How can we say that this analysis is legitimate? And how do we know that this debris could be the first tangible evidence that we have ever discovered, or at least confirmed, that we are not alone in the cosmos after all? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. That is some weird shit. Since I started covering UFO slash UAP topics in a lot greater detail over the last year and a half or so, I have discovered that it is very easy to jump down a rabbit hole when it comes to UFO footage. There is so much of it out there, and the vast majority of it can either be explained by mundane causes, mundane objects that are misidentified or just look a bit strange in our atmosphere, or simply things that have been been forged, things that have been created with our increasing skill in CGI and other special effects techniques. So although UFO footage is indeed fascinating and some of it can be quite compelling, we're never going to have solid evidence of the existence of extraterrestrial craft, if indeed this is what UAPs are, if we don't find some sort of physical evidence of their existence outside of the sorts of things that we can capture with our instruments. It is much more convincing if we can find something physical, something left over, some sort of remnant of these objects' presence, and if we could find debris, some sort of debris from a crash, an impact, or just the leftover remnants of the operation of one of these types of vehicles, that could be much more difficult evidence to dismiss. However, the UFO wreckage, or the supposed UFO wreckage that is been gathered over the course of the last several decades has, until now, not stood up to close laboratory inspection. But as I have reported over the last year and a half or so, Dr. Avi Loeb and the Galileo Project has gathered up debris at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean that appears to finally be the smoking gun that we've been looking for, debris that bears no resemblance whatsoever 
to any sort of natural substance or indeed any sort of substance that we are familiar with that occurs naturally within our solar system but bears a great deal of resemblance to artificial substances. But as we are about to see, the debris that was gathered by Dr. Loeb and his team could not possibly have come from a human point of origin. It came from outside, not only from outside our solar system, but from an entirely different solar system. So I'm going to be quoting extensively from Dr. Loeb's recent article and also from a paper that was recently published not only by him, but also by the other organizations around the world that were involved in the analysis of this amazing debris. The object in question is known as IM-1, and for those of you who are familiar with this story, I'm going to cover it rather briefly, and I'm going to link some videos that cover the topic a lot more comprehensively at the end of this video. So again, as I said, the object in question is known as IM-1, roughly about half a meter in size, very small, and it collided with Earth on January 8th, 2014, and it was picked up by the US Space Force, or at that time, the U.S. Air Force, which kept a very close eye on any objects that appear inside our atmosphere to make sure that they are not ballistic missiles on their way to strike a target inside the United States. The object was measured at a speed of 60 kilometers per second, which is faster than 95% of all the stars in our galaxy near the sun. But despite its high speed, it disintegrated in the lower atmosphere, where the air is dense and long after the object should have been completely destroyed by the intense heat generated by an object moving that quickly through our atmosphere. This implied that it was tougher than all meteors that have ever been documented by NASA in the CNEOS catalog of meteor fireballs. This is why Dr. Avi Loeb found himself very interested in this object, because it didn't seem to be a conventional meteor, and given the fact that it was traveling at 60 kilometers per second, which is well above the speed necessary to escape from the solar system, it had to have originated from outside the solar system. Now, there have been a number of scientists and astronomers who've tried to debunk this, saying that the object wasn't actually traveling this fast, it had been misidentified, but the U.S. military has repeatedly stated that they are 99.99% certain that this object object was traveling at the speed that was measured and came from an interstellar point of origin. But it took the Galileo project and Avi Loeb's research team a full year to plan an expedition to the fireball site of IM-1 in the Pacific Ocean. The U.S. Department of Defense provided the team with the exact location or the suspected location of the object off the coast of New Guinea, actually close to an island called Manus Island, and the team also surveyed a control area outside of this region to make sure that they were searching in the right area. If they found debris in both regions, both the control and the impact site, that would indicate that they didn't have the right site. So they were very thorough and had some pretty good equipment. They of course had a ship called the Silver Star and they anchored a sled full of magnets and dragged it across the ocean floor in the survey region and as I mentioned before in a control region outside of that area. The survey was carried out between the dates of June 14th and June 28th of 2023, and the team collected 850 tiny spherules, less than a millimeter each in size. And, but in spite of the tiny size of these spherules, they were very significant because these are the types of spherules one would expect to find in the impact site of a meteor that has made its journey through the atmosphere and had its metallic components shattered and melted into these tiny little objects. But it was the composition of these objects that was found to be so incredibly unusual. But the initial analysis wasn't enough. And days after the team announced their initial findings, they already found themselves under attack by many members of the mainstream scientific community and media who claimed that they had found nothing more than mundane and ordinary human debris because it did seem to be so artificial and it could not have come from a meteor. Indeed, they didn't even think that IM-1 was an interstellar object at all, in spite 
of the conclusions of the U.S. military. But undaunted, this team turned over their materials to a team of scientists and chemists all over the world, and the analysis was carried out by a variety of -of state-of-the-art laboratory instruments to determine exactly what the composition of these ferals was and just how unusual were these objects. And by the way, the analysis was carried out by instruments like the X-ray fluorescence analyzer, the electron probe microanalyzer, and an inductive coupled plasma mass spectrometer. It takes a considerable amount of time to analyze materials completely and thoroughly to make sure that you're not making any mistakes, to make sure the debris hasn't been contaminated by anything in the laboratory or anything that was gathered during the survey, and also to try to identify any missing volatiles. In other words, chemicals that may have been present in the object before it passed through the atmosphere but were subsequently burned off and the results were more bizarre than anyone ever suspected. 78% of the spherules showed up as being primitive. That is to say, they weren't all that different than materials that one would expect to find in a conventional meteor. However, 22% of the spherules, which is quite a few spherules, reflected a composition which was very different indeed. These spherules were classified as subset spherules, and they showed an excess of beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium, up to three orders of magnitude relative to the solar system standard of these types of elements in meteors or any other object in the solar system. In other words, these spherules contained up to a thousand times as much beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium as any object in the solar system that we have ever studied only artificial objects contain this much of these types of materials all in the same object. And oftentimes, you can find these types of materials present inside nuclear reactors. Beryllium is a substance used to control the intensity of nuclear reactions. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to give you a quick lesson in nuclear power. What you're looking at right now is the core of a nuclear reactor, or an animated depiction of one, surrounded by beryllium rods. And these beryllium rods can reflect neutrons back into the core of the reactor in order to intensify the nuclear reaction. But the other side of the rods, if they are rotated, are coated with boron, which slows down the intensity of the reaction. So if you rotate the rods with the beryllium side facing the reaction, it makes the reaction much more intense, producing a lot more energy and a lot more heat. And if you turn the rods in the opposite direction with the boron coating side facing the reactor core, then it slows down the reaction and cools the process. So again, beryllium, incredibly useful inside nuclear reactors or reactors used for nuclear engines. And of course, uranium is something we can expect to find in nuclear reactors as well. And by the way, the footage that you're watching right now comes from a NASA and Department of Energy document covering the development of nuclear thermal engines from the 1950s to the early 1970s. And so two of the elements that were discovered in the spherules are absolutely critical to the proper functioning of nuclear thermal engines or just about any other type of nuclear engine that makes use of fissile materials. Now, the lanthanum side of the equation is a little bit more complicated. You don't find that material as much inside nuclear reactors. But lanthanum alloys have a variety of commercial uses. For example, lanthanum nickel alloys are used to store hydrogen gas for use in hydrogen-powered vehicles. Lanthanum is also found in the anode of nickel metal hydride batteries used in hybrid cars. Rare earth compounds containing lanthanum are used extensively in carbon lighting applications, such as studio lighting and cinema projection. They increase the brightness and give an emission spectrum similar to sunlight. 
you see why Dr. Loeb has explored the possibility of these being artificial objects. Again, over 75% of the samples gathered appeared to be from an ordinary meteor, but it is the other 22% that is so unusual. It suggests a meteor that for some reason had a miniature nuclear reactor inside it or some other advanced piece of technology that requires the use of beryllium and uranium uranium impacted our planet in 2014. Now, it makes a great deal of sense for a spacecraft designed to survive the rigors of interstellar space for decades or perhaps even centuries to be built this way. If you take your more sensitive technology and sheath it inside a resilient meteoric object, it will be able to survive the intense radiation, micrometeoroids, and other hazards that might be encountered during a long interstellar journey and even perhaps survive passage through an atmosphere. And indeed, it almost did. We're talking about an object that made it to the densest parts of our atmosphere without being destroyed, in spite of the fact that it was traveling much faster than most meteors that impact our atmosphere, and it was so small that it shouldn't have been able to survive that long. This suggests something that may have been designed rather than something that came about by random chance in a distant solar system. Then again, there are possibilities that these materials could have been created as the result of some sort of supernova explosion, could have been thrown off from a white dwarf. There are potential natural explanations. But what's more important is the fact that the vast majority of the debris has yet to be found. And it is for this reason that the Galileo Project is going to be returning to this region of the Pacific Ocean off the coast of New Guinea to conduct a much more in-depth survey, and this time with a submersible, with cameras and other equipment designed to find the core of the object, which Dr. Loeb and his associates suspect probably survived atmospheric re-entry. And instead of examining a few hundred tiny spherules, we may instead be examining the core of the object to determine its true nature. And whatever is found in 2025, it is likely to throw the entire scientific community on its head. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. That brief documentary that you saw there, information on nuclear thermal engines, I have a much more in-depth video about the development of nuclear thermal engines and Werner Von Braun's vision of a nuclear-powered starship. If you're interested in videos like that, it's available to my Patreon subscribers. All the details details on how to join are in the description and again you can join for as little as three dollars a month thanks again for watching and as always stay angry about space